I want to welcome everybody to Mahon Hadar. Uh, my name is Rabbi Eli Confer. I'm the executive director uh, here at Mahon Hadar. We're so pleased to see so many new and, uh, and uh, familiar faces with us. Um, Mahon Hadar is really about raising pressing and critical issues in Jewish life to public discourse. Um, we do that in so many different ways, and tonight actually kicks, uh, kicks off our college winter learning seminar, a week-long program for uh, about 30 college students from around 20 campuses around the country who are coming to learn with us on the topic of Shabbat, um, which you'll recognize uh, as the topic of tonight's dialogue. Um, and we're really about elevating a public conversation of Torah that speaks to um, the issues that are relevant to all of our lives today. Uh, we, we can think of no better way to do that um, than to welcome a sitting U.S. Senator, Senator Joe Lieberman, um, to be with us tonight to speak about the role that Torah and Mitzvot has played in his life and to discuss with um, Rabbi Ethan Tucker, um, our uh, Rosh Yeshiva and uh, relative of Senator Lieberman, um, to dialogue around the meaning of all of these uh, important critical Jewish moments in his life um, to hopefully give some greater meaning for our own Jewish lives. So please uh, join me in welcoming Rabbi Ethan Tucker and Senator Joe Lieberman. Great to see everybody. Uh, I know we have a lot of sight lines, but you'll you'll move around in here, and I'm sure everyone will, will get a chance to see. Uh, I want to I want to welcome everyone and uh, thank everyone. Different different groups of people who are here. Uh, first of all, those who anchor this baby drash as a place of learning on a daily basis are full time fellows here at Yeshivat Hadar, uh, who help make everything possible here on a daily basis. Uh, and also, another special cohort of learners that we have here this week for our winter learning seminar, uh, 27 students from, I think, almost 20 campuses from all around the country uh, who are here to join us for an intensive week of learning uh, around Shabbat. Um, there's also uh, two other people I want to just uh, mention and thank. Uh, first of all, acknowledge the presence of Harold Winspoon, who's here this evening and who has helped to be uh, not just not just been a friend and a supporter of Mahon uh, Hadar from the start, but also uh, was a real uh, real force behind making this evening happen. Uh, the other person I want to acknowledge uh, and put front and center, even though she won't be uh, right here up with us, is my mother, Adasa Freyuk Lieberman, um, who is uh, back along with my stepfather, right back from Israel, visiting. Uh, uh, my sister, who is there, thank God for the year. And uh, just to begin, just by thanking my mother uh, for, among other things, beyond just being my mother, uh, being uh, a real driving force in my own thinking of what Torah has to be and should be for the world, and the ways in which we pay close attention, we ought to pay close attention to the moments in history in which we live, and the elements of the conversation that will focus around that axis tonight uh, very much drawn so much that you've taught me. Um, uh, I also want to say, by way of final introduction, uh, with respect to my other parent uh, up here this evening, uh, Senator Joe Lieberman, the, uh, the Mishnah plays out the unpleasant dilemma of what a person does when there is a conflict between uh, serving one's teacher and serving one's parent, uh, and how one balances what it means to honor one or the other when one has to make that choice. And I think one of the great privileges in life is to feel that your parents are among your deepest teachers, uh, such that the conflict never arises. And uh, I hope in the context of this conversation uh, that so much of what I've learned from you and by your example uh, will come out and just to, before we get any further, just to thank you for that as well. Uh, uh, as, as we say on the Senate floor, I've asked my distinguished colleague if I might interrupt. <laughs> uh, I've learned a lot from uh, a time, too. Uh, it's took a lot. And, uh, so I want to begin by thanking your mother, too. <laughs> Because uh, if it weren't for her, I would never have come to know you as well as I do. And uh, though uh, I am not uh, your biological parent, I, I certainly consider you to be my son, and I'm very, very proud of everything you've done. I just said to a group of people before that when I met Eitan, he was six years old, 
and uh, he was already impressive. He was, uh, I know this will shock you, but he was adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had some capacities that one doesn't expect in a six-year-old. He had a phenomenal memory. And uh, at six or shortly thereafter, it seemed to me that he had learned uh, every interstate highway in the United States and could tell you how to get from wherever we are to wherever you wanted to go. And in some sense, I suppose this led him uh, inevitably to become a rabbi. <laughs> the other connection was that uh, when I met him, I don't know that this was me who gave you this name, but affected by a movie that was popular around that time, we called him E.T as in uh, extraterrestrial, uh, which also suggested uh, the spiritual future. <laughs> anyway, uh, E.T. E has really enriched uh, No, I've got to stop that. He's now Rob A. Tom. <laughs> he has really uh, enriched um, our lives, and uh, I'm very proud of what he and uh, Ellie and Shai have done in creating uh, Yeshivat Machan Hadar. It's really unusual and uh, extraordinary. It, they've created a community of scholars, uh, it's a community of prayer, and it's a community of service to the community. And um, of course it's uh, coincidentally a community in which men and women have equal uh, access and responsibility to be in, in involved in all of those communities. And I, I think it's, this is something unique in, um, in Jewish history. So I meant to ask you, last week I was actually in Erbil, Kurdistan, and uh, the Council General was talking about the rich Jewish history there and said that, he's not Jewish, said that he thought that perhaps the first Jewish rabbi, this woman, woman Jewish rabbi, was from a town called Barzan, and she had the same name as the current uh, I'm looking to see if I have to Google this or you've heard of this. No, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe it's apocryphal. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, I'm a big fan of Makon uh, Hadar. Um, uh, I was telling each of you before when I was thinking it's just earlier this evening that I read a book once by Rabbi David Hartman in which he called A Heart of Many Chambers. It was his, I think, description of what Judaism should be, and I think the term comes from Talmud. Uh, which is to say that Judaism is a big enough heart that it should have chambers that are many and that therefore are accessible to as many people as possible. So nobody feels, as you said, uh, that they're just these boxes. And if you don't fit exactly in those boxes, somehow you're not able to be a learned or uh, active Jew. And I think Makon Hadar has created a, uh, another uh, uh, chamber in the heart of Judaism, which is a big chamber uh, that clearly was needed because of the, uh, of the number of people that have, that have come to it and will continue to come to it. And I think not only, so, that, so I consider it not only to be an important part of the Jewish history, but also an important part of the Jewish future. And I'm, uh, a, a signal of that is this really wonderful program that uh, you've given me the honor of beginning tonight with these college students on break. So this is good. They don't go to the Caribbean. They don't go to <laughs> Fort Lauderdale. They come to my home. Right. At least a small percentage of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is the righteous remnant. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, let's begin, let's jump right in. We're obviously here tonight to talk about uh, the book and the theme of Shabbat, the gift of rest. And I want to begin with what I think, and I think you feel is a kind of crying need in our society for Shabbat uh, and for so much of what it represents and that the book has had such a positive reception because of that intrinsic need in society. You begin the book uh, by arguing that essentially this is a gift that anyone in their right mind would accept. And you write, how could I do all my work as a senator if I did not stop to observe the Sabbath each week? Um, there's been this deep rekindling of an interest in Shabbat, particularly, I think, in the information age, as we've had you know, people just feeling enslaved by all of their various devices. This recent book, Hamlet's Blackberry, uh, investigates this. You have organizations like Reboot that have had a national day of unplugging with great fanfare. Maybe you can open by reflecting for us a little on what is wrong with our contemporary culture that Shabbat might be able to fix? Yeah. Um, in what ways are we enslaved in this 24-7 world? And 
how Shabbat, particularly in your experience, has been able to unlock that? So, okay, that's a big question. I said point time when you told me what <coughs> I wanted to talk about that I've probably done more than a hundred interviews or discussions on the book, and his questions were different than anybody else's naturally. <laughs> um, let, me, let me begin way out here. Um, uh, I don't, I actually thought about this after I wrote the book and it was published. Years ago, I um, spent some time in a conversation with a man whose name I think is Regis McKenna. It's a long time ago. He, he was in, from Silicon Valley, and he said something so interesting to me at the time, I thought, so I repeat it, which was that, uh, talking about the ages of, um, sort of human development, but history, commercial development. He said, in the agricultural age, people lived where they worked. They lived on a farm. They worked on a farm. In the uh, industrial age, people <coughs> left their homes to go to work in the factory or the office. In the information or electronic age, which we're in now, you never leave your work uh, unless you really exercise some discipline uh, to do so. Because you can be, there you go. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, it's all right, it happens all the time. <laughs> all right. So, um, because we carry our uh, our cell phones, our Blackberries, our iPads, our iPhones with us all the time. And uh, therefore, the separations, I think, that are um, conducive to healthy living um, are harder to impose. Uh, the, the, the cell phone or the Blackberry can interrupt, therefore, some of your most important relationships uh, when you're home with your family, away from work. Um, they can uh, interrupt you when you're trying to just think and read. And um, I, I don't know that the Almighty had the blackbird in mind when he uh, gave the fourth commandment to Moshe on Mount Sinai to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But it, of course, it, as you said, I describe it as a gift. It began with a commandment, as we all know. But I've always, or most of the time, experienced it as a gift. And in our time, I think it is a gift that's desperately needed because we are, um, we're not the divisions that should exist. So why did I say what I did about, um, I don't know that I could be the, the center that I'd like to be if I didn't observe Shabbat. Because one, Shabbat uh, does, uh, it stops and therefore it stops everything and gives you perspective. There's a natural way in which you look back on Shabbat to the week that preceded and you think about the week ahead. So, so just physically and intellectually and hopefully spiritually regenerate. So every day is not like uh, this, the, the same day, every other day. Um, this part is the part that, so far as a just randomly moving around, uh, the, two different kinds of people, maybe self-evidently, that have been reading the book and commenting to me. One are people who are observant, who are Jewish and interested in Shabbat and have read it. The other are people who are Jewish and not observant or are Christian. And the, the one part of the book that they most mentioned to me is this part, of, and it's all about the electronic devices. And I had a fascinating, I went out, was invited out to, to Brigham Young University to speak well, somewhat about the book, but more generally. And the president of the university had read the book. And matter of fact, he was good enough to read the galley sheets. And there's a comment from him, a uh, generous comment in the book. And he said, you know, i got to tell you that when I read the book, I realized that I'm doing things on Sunday that I should not be doing. And um, I was anxious to hear what he was going to Say. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm using my Blackberry too much. So I just, I decided after I read the book, I'm going to turn it off. And uh, my Sabbath is much less interrupted. And I find now, when I turn it on on Sunday night or Monday morning, there are many fewer emails there because people now know that I, I don't uh, use the Blackberry. And they'll wait till Monday morning. 
And uh, that was a, those are important lessons. So yeah, it's interesting what you said about the agricultural society because I think what it what it brings in my mind is you know when the when the Mishnah wants to say don't work on Shabbat, essentially what it does is it goes through the list of things that you do in the field and says, don't do any of those things. And the list of things that we think of as melacha, the kind of poor forbidden labors, are simply the work tasks that they did in the field. And you almost imagine if the you know, mission were being written today, the 39 categories would be, don't open your inbox, don't forward <laughs> something, don't <laughs> plug this in. Yeah. Uh, and there is a truth to that where I think actually one of the challenges for thinking about the halachot of Shabbat uh, are the ways in which actually some things that we think of as maybe minor offenses, oh, it's it's only the use of electricity, or it's only something that we don't identify as kind of plowing the field, are in a way plowing the field, and actually need to be treated with much greater severity. I agree, it's a good point. So anyway, that's more, so, so that, yeah. you know that, um, I, this is hearsay, so, but I gather in some uh, observant Jewish communities, there's a lot of anxiety now about um, texting among teenagers on Shabbat because the kids are addicted. And even though they're otherwise, apparently, uh, Sabbath observant, but they can't stop texting and they're trying to figure out, notwithstanding the halakha. Right, right, no, it's a real challenge. Uh, I wanted to, much of the book is, uh, is very personal. I wanted to quote one passage that particularly moved me uh, that comes from your personal experience. Here's what you write. It might seem that desisting from work and other weekday activities on the Sabbath would make it harder to advance your career and would sour your relationships with coworkers, customers, or constituents. I worried about that too. It's true that after I was elected to my first public office as state senator in 1970 and began turning down invitations to political or community events on Friday evenings and Saturdays, people were puzzled, frustrated, and sometimes angry. But once it became clear that I was saying no as a matter of faith consistent religious observance of the Sabbath, people were not just accepting, but respectful, even admiring. I wonder if you could share with us a bit some <coughs> stories of that admiration, maybe particularly some from the 2000 uh, presidential, vice presidential campaign, uh, places like La Crosse, Wisconsin. <laughs> You're a very good interviewer. <laughs> so let me sort of start with a general statement, uh, which is, Obviously, I grew up in America, I've lived in America, so my uh, experiences in America, and my, I know that it's different from a lot of other places in the world. What, what I'm saying is that um, this is a generally uh, religious country. By that I mean to say, I saw a poll done by the Pew PEW Foundation a while back that said something. Well, over 50% of the American people say that they regularly attend a house of worship. Um, and uh, more than 90% uh, say they believe in God or some kind of higher authority. Um, so uh, God is running well ahead of any elected official. Which is reassuring. So, I, so, there, so I, I say that as part of a context, which really goes back to the founding generation of Americans of respect for religion. You can see it in the founding documents, Declaration of Independence, obviously the First Amendment, uh, uh, guaranteeing religious freedom. Uh, and uh, the other thing working here, I believe, is a phrase that has meant something for quite a while to Christians, hasn't meant as much to Jews, which is the Judeo-Christian tradition. I, I think that this is not perfect, of course, and there have been anti-Semitism and continues to exist in different ways, but uh, there are an awful lot of Christians in this country who feel that their history is tied, their religious narrative, though, though it obviously takes a big turn at one point, is tied to Jewish history, and particularly biblical history. And so I was operating in that context. So I think that's part of why the respect So not, uh, for the religious observance. So maybe I'll start with one story, uh, and then I'll get to La Crosse. Uh, when I was running for the Senate in 1988, I was in a real long shot campaign against the incumbent senator. And um, about a week and a half before the campaign, I got a call from a friend of mine his name is Con O'Leary, 
Uh, he was then the Senate, state Senate majority leader. And he said, you know, I think you're going to win the election. And I said, that's good news, Tom, because right now, probably you, you and I are the only people who think I'm going to win the election. Why do you think I'm going to win the election? So he said, uh, to the story short, I went to visit my mother yesterday. She was there with three other Irish Catholic or Catholic ladies. And that was 88. George H.W. Bush was running against Michael Dukakis. I asked him, oh, there he was, as a Democrat, I asked him, we are going to vote for her for president? They said, Bush, I tried to argue with them why they should vote for Dukakis. I couldn't convince them. So I said, what about the Senate? What about uh, Lieberman and Weicker? And my mother said, oh, I'm voting for uh, Lieberman. And the other women nodded their heads. And so he said, why, why is that so e easy a decision? And he said, my mother said, I like the fact that uh, Lieberman is a religious person and he observes his Sabbath. So who knows? Obviously, I didn't observe the Sabbath as a result of a, a poll or a focus group. <laughs> that I should blame on my parents and my rabbis. But So there's one example. The other one in 2000, this was a moment when the first place we went after the nominating convention was in Wisconsin because Alan Tipper Gordon does my the one before they knew I was the, going to be the candidate. They had scheduled a, uh, a, a steamboat ride down the uh, Mississippi. It was actually a wonderful three or four days. So we started in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, my own uh, Shabbat observance gave the campaign and the Secret Service a new <laughs> task, which was to find the closest place within a circle that I could get back to by sundown on Friday. And we went down the river, and then I left at a certain point to go back to La Crosse. Uh, La Crosse had one uh, synagogue, which was a combined Orthodox conservative reform. <laughs> uh, and um, so we walked to that shul that Shabbat morning, and it was really touching to me in Hadassah, and, and because the people came out of their houses to uh, greet us and to say good Sabbath. And it reminded me of, of a story I told in the book, too, about my grandmother, who was an immigrant, who you know, went through the normal unease of being Jewish in Central Europe at that time. When she came to America and lived in Stamford, Connecticut, in this neighborhood, which was a lot of different nationalities, a couple of African-American families, it was a miracle to her that people would, when she walked to synagogue on Saturday morning, would say, we're good Sabbath, Mrs. Manger. And um, that, I had a feeling of a kind of circle when that happened. In, 2000. Um, perhaps I'll add just one more thing for by way of uh, American Jewish sociology. On the night when we flew to Nashville, uh, the night before Vice President Gore announced that he had selected me, he said to me that he had talked to um, several people about the vice presidential selection, both uh, Christians and Jews about whether America was ready to have somebody Jewish running on a national ticket, and, uh, or whether there would be still some an enough anti-Semitism that it would jeopardize his chances of getting elected. And he said his conclusion was that the fear of anti-Semitism among Jews was dramatically greater than the reality of anti-Semitism among Christians or non-Jews, and therefore he was free to make the choice uh, he made. I mean, I could go on with too many stories about this, but um, I always like to, when I'm answering this kind of question, say that the numerical results of the 2000 election, <laughs> as distinguished from the electoral election, <laughs> show that Al Gore and I have got a half a million more votes than uh, George Bush and Dick Cheney. And I don't mention that, you know, to relitigate the results, but just to show, though I'd be happy to. <laughs> just to show in the clarity of the numbers of an election how the presence of a, of a Jewish American on a national ticket, and one who I presume most people knew was religiously observant and Sabbath observant, didn't stop them from um, voting for uh, the ticket. I, I, I'm forgetting, I just have one final story from my mind. 
Al Gore said to me at one private moment during the campaign that, you know, he was he's a pretty religious guy, and he said, um, I, I regret so much that I, I didn't make a rule of uh, not doing politics on Sunday. Um, and he says, you know what, if we get elected, I'm going to start observing uh, the Sabbath on Sunday, <laughs> he said. Um, so, I'll watch the store on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, a, no, it's a perfect segue into maybe talking a little bit about governing and the question of governing. And here I'm hoping maybe we can play out a question I, I actually struggled with quite a bit. Um, it would seem to me that there are some limits on what a Shomer Shabbat observant person could do. Um, notwithstanding some very prominent examples to the contrary, obviously your own career, um, I think of, you know, Ilan Ramon of blessed memory, the Israeli astronaut, uh, who went up and was very particular in going on to that spacecraft that he would have kosher food and that things would sort of be in keeping with what a religious Jew uh, would need as part of that, that regime. Uh, and, you know, Rav Moshe Feinstein is perhaps the most famous posik in uh, American Jewish life who really kind of answered questions from all kinds of places. And he has this amazing tshuva where a guy is asking him, uh, because he's in a theater company, whether he can have a Gentile apply cold cream to his face to remove the makeup that he's put on for the performance on Friday before Shabbat, after the show's over on Shabbat. Right? And you can imagine Rav Moshe sort of sitting there saying, I can't believe I have to answer this. <laughs> uh, and yet answering it, right? And there is there's some aspect there of, well, the Torah has to go wherever people go. But that said, and I wonder sometimes that maybe there are certain things that, no, actually they require a certain pattern of living that is antithetical to what it means to observe Shabbat. So I'm interested in maybe pushing you a little. I feel you have a, you have a very strong, I know both personally, but also it comes out in the book, this notion that Jews should be able to serve in representative government. Right? And a religious Jew should be able to serve uh, in that kind of role. And I want to ask, why? Right? Why, why might we not say that Jews, at least in a Gentile diasporic government, right, may have to be among the represented and not among those doing the representing? And to the extent that I know you feel to the contrary, yeah. why? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, well, so let me start from the American point of view, which is inclusive, which is that um, the vision that the founders had, I think, was that, uh, as expressed in the founding documents, was that everybody should have the opportunity to serve. I mean, they did something quite remarkable that when they wrote the Constitution, well, certainly the, the, yeah, the Constitutional Article Six. I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, there were several of the original states that had religious qualifications for office. That you had to be a Christian, or you had to be a particular kind of Christian in some states. And the Founding Fathers came along in Article 6 and said uh, there can't be any religious test for holding office in this country. So, so my first answer goes to the, to the, uh, uh, to the Constitution. Um, the second is that, uh, you know, this is, let's see, how can I best and most briefly do this? This, this is a land in which we value equal opportunity, and I don't think anybody should be excluded, including observant Jews, from aspiring to, to any job, public or private, that they want to. I mean, one of the remarkable things that I've seen happen in my lifetime is uh, the opening up of almost every sector of uh, public and private life to uh, people who are religiously observant. Uh, and accommodations being made in the best sense of a lot of cases about accommodating to religious or legal cases. But you know, it wasn't so long ago that most major law firms in this country, or a lot of them, didn't accept Jews as partners. Today, some of those same firms <coughs> have kosher kitchens in the firm because they're accommodating to the people that they <coughs> want to hire. So. Um, and of course, we have something else, and I'll go back to your, the specifics of your uh, question about representative government. We are blessed uh, not only to be in this extraordinary country with all the freedom it's given, 
us and everybody else, but uh, we're, we're alive at a time when the state of Israel has been re-established, obviously. So now, for the first time in 2,000 years, we have a representative Jewish government, a state. And um, you know, obviously, for the most part, there are Jews holding office there and uh, carrying out responsibilities that require them to work on Shabbat. Um, intelligence, law enforcement, defense, um, all of that stuff. And I, I try to pursue this a little bit in writing the book just to get a sense of what the, what the rabbis in Israel have uh, poskined, you know, uh, ruled on this. And they've been quite accommodating to this because of, for, for a lot of Talmudic, from, based on a lot of Talmudic sources that you'd be better to describe than I. Although I must say, in my, in, both in, in discussions I've had with rabbis as I was in my public life, and um, <coughs> research that I did just wanting to make sure that what I was writing was based in, in fact. Uh, there are a lot of very old the Tump rabbinical rulings, um, not just the, the most obvious of the book, not for Virgin allowing doctors and others to take, mandating them to take actions on Shabbat that you wouldn't otherwise be permitted to take for, for the purpose of saving or protecting life, but to do things that, well, like going to a Roman circus on Shabbat because that's where the power structure was, and maybe if the leaders of the Jewish community were there, they'd be able to create relationships that would be protective of the Jewish community. Now I say quickly, or one of them I love is that uh, at one point there was a Jewish rebellion against the Parthian Empire, and it appeared that the uh, uh, Parthian Empire was going to strike at the rebels on Shabbat, thinking they wouldn't fight, but uh, they were the rebels said they, sh they had to fight. And uh, of course the happy ending is that they won every time they were attacked. <laughs> And anyway, there's a lot of precedent. Now, the, the important thing to say, and I'll stop here, is that unlike the Jews who went to the Roman circus and Jews throughout a lot of the last 2,000 years who were living in societies where um, they were not uh, really equal, um, today, you know, Jews occupy a position, obviously in Israel, but even here, positions throughout the executive, judicial, and legislative branches of our government. So I don't know that a rabbi would say that a uh, leader of the Jewish community should go to a bar on Saturday because other leaders of the non-Jewish government were there. Uh, so that, that could be a conversation. Yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, and the category, and you talk about it a bit in the book, of karov la malchut, you know, someone who is uh, close to the government, and they're therefore given certain dispensations minimally to look like Gentiles and sort of pass uh, in all kinds of ways that perhaps, you know, with, with a certain other kind of attire, and since it's flying out, they might have a hard time doing. Um, there's a sort of deeper uh, question, I think, of how we move from that category to today being not karov uh, malchut, but in some cases the malchut, right? I mean, you're actually in the position of authority. I've always thought it's interesting, you know, when, particularly even in the, you know, when you think about halakha and you think about uh, psak and these rulings, you know, there's sort of the, the formal legal language that's being deployed to engage a certain situation, and then there is the actual effect of it. And what's interesting is that the, the I agree with you 100%, the consequences uh, that people and rabbis are willing to kind of underwrite, as it were, with, uh, with a legal uh, opinion, are often quite broad. Um, obviously, power plants run in Israel 24-7 uh, and any number of other kind of core Jewish institutions. But the legal language actually often is not quite that broad. That is to say, the standard way you explain that the power plants run in Israel is that while the hospitals need them, that's involving saving lives. Once you have to run it for the hospital, so you run it for everyone else. But in a way, it actually misses the essence of the point, which is that there's something about statecraft itself that demands some kind of response. I remember this was a, there were almost riots in Israel a few years ago when you know Kavish Misparachad, the main road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, was going to be shut down 
uh, in order to move this major, what was it, an electrical uh, component, right? It was a major component that had to shut down the entire road. Uh, and the only time they could do that without completely disrupting uh, the traffic flow was on Friday night, right? And it was this sort of huge uproar of, well, this is not saving anyone's life at this moment. And in that sense, the Jewish state should stand tall for, yes, we're going to have impossible massive traffic jams for an entire day <coughs> in order to show what it means that we value Shabbat against voices that were saying, but without the legal language to express it, this is almost like in a separate category of what a state has to do. Um, and I don't know, I myself am sort of torn about that because in a way, and we'll get to this a bit, but obviously what Shabbat stands for, going back to where we started, Shabbat is so deeply important that it does probably require some massive demonstration of inconvenience to honor it. Um, yet, that category, Karoba <coughs> Malchut, is fundamentally a kind of diasporic, powerless category in a way that modern Jewish power uh, is not so easily joined with. Uh, I think that's pretty well said. No, I, I, um, I agree. And I've been aware as I've gone along that I'm, I, at least in Congress, I've been, as a member of Congress, I've been breaking new ground. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, you, you tell me whether you think this is appropriate. I've said to my rabbi, Let's have a conversation, and I want to uh, pose some questions to you, but I'm not asking you to Pascha. I'm not asking you to rule. Uh, I, I just want you to inform my decision, because I, I want to accept responsibility. Maybe I don't want to put responsibility on you. Maybe I'm not sure what your answer is going to be. <laughs> but I have been, so in deciding what to do on Shabbat or, not, or what not to do, it's not always been easy, and I will tell you just to vote this in the I have never missed a vote that occurred on Shabbat. And sometimes uh, some personal inconvenience, our family inconvenience. And I will tell you that because what, my colleagues don't want to be there on Friday night or Saturday, not because they Shabbat, but because they want to go home, they want to do something else. Uh, so usually, or even go further than that, on most occasions when there are votes on Friday night and Saturday, they're significant, and arguably they could come within one of the uh, sort of exceptions. Although I, I try to do this in a way that I don't, most of the time I've been able to do it in a way that I don't break any of the uh, prohibitions of Shabbat. But I, I must be honest and say that I've been down there sometimes voting on issues that are not, uh, wouldn't come up to any of the standards. And um, I know that the reason for that is something probably more sociological or political, which is that it seemed unfair to me that uh, in offering myself as candidate for the Senate from Connecticut, that I would um, essentially deprive the people of Connecticut of half of their representation in the Senate on those votes that occurred on Friday night or Saturday because of my Shabbat observance. There's another sense in which I must say, this is sort of you know, I don't know what category to put it in, I have realized that I'm doing something that hasn't been done before, and I don't want to ruin it for the people who are, the men and women who are Shabbat observant who are going to follow me, that somebody's going to say to them, oh, Lieberman, he wasn't there that night that there was the big vote on uh, school funding or whatever, because it was a Friday night. So it's, so I, I, I certainly don't, Claim perfection or purity here. There have been decisions I've made that have been close ones. Uh, and on the end, that's why I think that, uh, I have to accept responsibility for them, not, not to blame them on uh, a rabbi's blessing. I'll just follow up on that and also flag for members of the audience that in a little bit of time we will uh, begin passing out some index cards for those who are interested in uh, asking a question. Uh, so we can pass them up here, and then I can uh, select a few from the group. So if you have some questions that are coming to your mind, think about them, and we'll announce a formal spot for you to record them and pass those in uh, in a few minutes. Uh, you've had a long-standing principle regarding what you will or won't do on Shabbat, and essentially it's been anything relating to politics is off limits, whereas you find a way to accommodate pretty much anything relating to governing. So in light of what you just said, maybe just share with us uh, you know, a, a couple of those experiences of needing to 
uh, being put in a difficult Shabbat yeah. situation because of governing. And I'm also thinking another story I think would be great to hear, which is not a, not a formal act of voting, but nonetheless a kind of responsibility, uh, your walk to the inauguration in 2001, which happened on Shabbat. Uh -huh. <laughs> So I'll say that one for the end. Um, so generally speaking, when the Senate's meeting on Friday night and Saturday, we know about it beforehand. Sometimes it's kind of a surprise that we'll go longer on the Fridays. So it'll be Shabbat will have started. And if I know there's no session the next day, no votes the next day, I'll just walk home. Um, or if I know that there's going to be Friday night and Saturday, I'll stay downtown sometimes in Dusk. Which are the Shabbat the hotel there. Um, but um, there have been some occasions where that hasn't happened, and th there are two occasions when, and this is where I just had to make a, 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 a judgment, a personal judgment, pretty quickly. Two occasions uh, during the 90s. One, uh, no, no, one during the 90s, one uh, about oh, six or seven years ago. One during a, a budget crisis when I remember Senator Chafee of Rhode Island, now passed away, a wonderful man. I was involved in a bipartisan group with him trying to work on some kind of budget compromise to avoid a, uh, uh, to try to deal with the deficit. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it was Shabbat. We weren't in session, but there was a lot of meetings going on, and he sent somebody out to the House and said, uh, there's a meeting that we didn't expect is really important, and please come in. And I thought, Okay, uh, I'm, I got in the car and I, I was taking it. Second one was similar. Uh, this would have been 2004. Susan Collins, Senator from Maine, I worked very closely with her. This was about the uh, reform of the intelligence community after 9/11. I was very much involved in it. And she said this thing. She sent somebody out again. This thing is falling apart. And I know it's Saturday, but I need you to come in. So I did go in. Uh, in one case, the one with Chafee. The truth is. At the end of the meeting, I realized that I, I didn't need to be there. And basically because nothing particularly came out of it. But then I, I if there's any, uh, I'm, I think I should invite you to comment on this. I started to think about the fact that when a doctor is called to go to the hospital to treat a patient who's been rushed there, the doctor doesn't know whether he, he or she is going to save the life of the patient. So you can't judge it that way. But it seemed to me, and the other, the other one with Collins was quite, um, important and I felt my presence was productive to getting legislation adopted. The, the, uh, the other occasions which are awkward are when phone calls come into the house and I describe at the beginning of a chapter on this very question about when you, when I, I felt that I, I had to do something I wouldn't normally do on Shabbat, a phone call from a colleague, Lindsey Graham, on a Saturday. He would, and I and John Kerry were working on climate change legislation years ago. Long story short, I knew in the preceding week that he was thinking of leaving the bill would have been well, probably devastating to our chances it was. He called, but he hadn't made a decision. I talked to him Friday afternoon. He called, and we have an uh, answering machine, and I heard the call come in. I wish I could impersonate a southern draw, but he said, hey, Joe, buddy, I really hate to break up, you know, interrupt your, your, your sack, <laughs> but uh, not Shabbat. But uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking of breaking off this uh, leaving the energy bill, climate change bill, and I've got to talk to you before I do. So I picked it up. Uh, and I tried to talk him out of it. I didn't. Um, there have been other cases. If, I have a rule generally that if anybody in a security position calls that out, like the President's National Security Advisor, Secretary of Homeland Security, or Secretary of Defense, I'm going to take the call because I just assume it's important. Sometimes, uh, I, the last lap is on me, which is there was once in 1990 or 91, I was a new senator, maybe 90, and it's Friday night, we're at dinner, and I, the air turn machine goes on, and I hear a very official voice say, Senator Lieberman, uh, Vice President Quayle would like to talk to you. So I, like, I got to pick up the phone, and said, Vice President the next day. And he says, hey, Joe, I, I just, I'm on a plane. I just read that speech you gave about the capital gains tax cut, and I can't thank you enough. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, two thousand. 
So, um, obviously, it was after all the tumult of the 2000 election. It turned out that January 20th, La Chaz, as you say, uh, came out on a Shabbat. And, uh, but, you know, Al Gore was going, and I felt I had to go. I would, would look terrible, sore loser, et cetera. So, Hadassah and I took a room at a hotel uh, on Capitol Hill. And we, we, we moved in on Friday afternoon. And it was, I don't know how to describe it. It was as if you were a, uh, I'm going to be very parochial, excuse me, Shai. Uh, if if you were a Yale uh, graduate, <laughs> it was the weekend of the Harvard Yale game, and you ended up in a hotel which was loaded with Harvard, uh, <laughs> and the game was over. Now it was after the game, <laughs> and Harvard had won, and they're partying and everything. So anyway, and I said, I love each other. And we said, we got to get out of here. This is <laughs> and because uh, every, uh, every time we opened the door, people would say, hey, Lieberman, I can't believe you're here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, 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 we called our staff first. We said, we got to take us home, get us out of here. We called neighbors who were Sabbath observants, had dinner with them. And then uh, the next morning, it was pretty cold. We walked down. You want me to tell this part of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah good. So uh, we took the walk. It was about four and a half miles. And uh, at one point, we passed by. On the other side of Lafayette Park from the White House, there was like a roadblock we walked through. And it turned out to be the and President Bush and Jimmy were at this church across the street where they go to a service on a normal day. Anyway, we kept walking. And we got toward the Capitol. And I heard just as they say, the, the sound of distant thunder, it turned out to be thousands of protesters uh, to the election of Bush and Cheney. And um, the, it just happened that there was no way to get up to the podium um, without going by them. And it was, a, it was an incredible experience because they were so thrilled to see me. <laughs> Imagine, why are you walking? <laughs> so, Anyway, and the final thing I remember is that as I uh, walked up on the platform, the, the rest of the senators had already been ushered out. We were a little late there, but this, the ceremony had not started. And uh, I had come to know Colin Powell uh, earlier when he was Secretary of Defense, not National Security Advisor, and a chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and uh, not Secretary of Defense. And, uh, um, I knew a lot about his background in the Bronx. So he sees me and he says, oh, Lieberman, you couldn't even get here on time. <laughs> so he was, at that point, the Secretary-designate of the uh, Secretary of State designate. So we, we, this was his sense of humor. So I said, hey, Powell, I thought you were supposed to be the greatest Shabbos boy in the history of the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, oh, Forgive me, <laughs> Senator and Mrs. Lieberman. Thank you for coming here on your seventh day. <laughs> uh, if someone who I don't know who has the index cards in the crew, but if you have those and people want to, uh, if you want to raise your hand up, if you'd like a card to jot down, uh, Ellie Lamb will be coming around to do that. I want to move to a couple other uh, meaty issues here. Uh, one of them in particular is the kind of tension between the personal Shabbat, which a lot of your book is about, what it means to experience Shabbat as an individual, and the social Shabbat, the Shabbat of, uh, of the community, the broader community. Um, I think one of the things that is, that is difficult here is, I'm not sure how easily, well this is the question I want to pose. The book in a way is a kind of a pitch for, take Shabbat into your life, it will enrich it, it will make it better, um, and you will be, you'll, you'll be the better off. Um, the challenge is whether the voluntaristic Shabbat is enough. Uh, when Dvarim talks about Shabbat, it says very clearly that its motivation for it is not primarily spiritual uplift, but the Zahar Takiyev and Agita Be'eretz Mitzrayim. Remember you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and on some level, the reason I am having Shabbat and enforcing it on you is because I don't want anyone to be enslaved. And the only way that that can really play out is by the society getting back then. I want to take you back to something, words that are, if we can get uh, someone just to cue up here the, the audio here. 
Um, blue laws. Um, I just, I'll give you the signal in a second. Um, a case that you litigated, argued before the Supreme Court, back in 1984, um, when you were Attorney General of the State of Connecticut, it was the State of Thornton v. Calder. You write about it briefly in the book. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but there had been blue laws in Connecticut uh, for many years, and like in many states, they were being repealed. And one of the things that the legislature wanted to do in repealing those laws was still to enshrine a protection for individual workers that they didn't have to work on their Sabbath. So now that Caldor, the department store, uh, was going to be open on Sunday, no one should lose their job as a continuing employee because they wanted to continue to observe the Sabbath on Sunday, even if the corporation no longer was. And the Connecticut State Supreme Court actually struck down this law as violating the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. And it came before the United States, was, before the United States Supreme Court, was this a violation of the separation of church and state? So I want you just to hear a brief clip of words that are familiar, though I bet you haven't heard them in the last 27 years. Go ahead. If the decision of the Connecticut Supreme Court is allowed to stand, the purposes of the Establishment Clause are literally in my opinion, turned on their head, for that clause was surely aimed at protecting religious diversity and promoting religious freedom, is used here as an instrument for invalidating a law which our legislature adopted with the best of motivations and in the finest tradition, permissible tradition, of accommodating the values embodied in the religion clauses of the First Amendment. If this uh, decision is allowed to stand, it really does speak to the ability of the state to act with hostility and callous indifference toward religious freedom that this court has repeatedly warned against. And for those reasons, we respectfully ask you to reverse. Very well, Mr. Attorney General. <laughs> that was Chief Justice Parker. Um, it's a great, great clip from the past. When I, when I want to sort of leverage that for the question is, I think part of what you were arguing there, to give it a little more full-throated religious language, was on some level, the state and some degree of coercion is actually required to protect the religious freedom of the observance of the Sabbath, of Shabbat. Um, I feel, you know, this was, if I remember being horrified this year hearing that stores were opening Black Friday at midnight, some of them I think even 10 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day. Um, and the sense in which the relentless engine of capitalism, you know, it just it finds its way wherever it is let in. How do we balance that? On the one hand, being a country that's committed to religious freedom, and yet if we're committed to the Sabbath and we actually want people to get something out of Shabbat, can we actually have the state not be able? Uh, first, I want, I want to say that somewhere in heaven, Tim Russert is smiling. <laughs> he pulled an old clip out of me, and uh, it was fun to hear it. Uh, he used to do that on Meet the Press. Um, so, uh, in that case, uh, what was at stake was that the law was attempting, even though the blue laws had been repealed, as you said, was attempting to put pressure on employers to accommodate their religious practices. And the employer, Caldor, um, basically said to Mr. Thornton, who was a religious Presbyterian, as I recall, and observed the Sabbath, that they would accommodate by allowing him to work on another day, but in somewhere in upstate New York, which wasn't exactly uh, effective accommodation because he would have to drive up there. Um, so, so to me, that case was about protecting religious freedom, a little bit different from establishing um, the blue laws with which, which ordained that, look, which ordained that certain uh, commercial activity doesn't happen on Sunday. This is such a complicated question because the blue laws obviously accepted the societal um, consensus about the Sabbath or the majority opinion, which was that it was on Sunday, which is obviously the Christian Sabbath. Um, although there usually were accommodations in all those laws so that um, people who observed another day as the Sabbath could keep their stores open on Sunday. It wasn't always the case, but in a lot of states that was the case. 
Uh, over the years, I've met people who were children of Jewish merchants who said if it wasn't for that exception in the blue laws, they probably never could have afforded to go to college and graduate school because their parents did uh, pretty well uh, as a result of that. So, you know, when I say we're not going to go back to the blue laws, I'm, I really mean in terms of where the society has gone. Although, I, I will tell you that um, if I could, I would. And even though it's, it's Sunday is obviously the Christian Sabbath, so you might say that's ordaining a, uh, that's, that's establishing religion. I, I think you could argue that um, it's achieving a societal value. That we, I think we've lost something. When I was growing up in a neighborhood in Stanford, most of my friends were not Jewish, a lot of them were, but the, there were a lot of Catholics particularly, but even some of the Protestants. But, um, they, the, my friends were expected to go to church on Sunday, and if they somehow wiggled their way out of that responsibility, they were expected to be home for the family meal. This is the familial communal, communal part of, um, of Sabbath observance. And um, they were able to do that, or most of the parents were, because most of the stores were closed. So they were, were required to work. Uh, and. Um, they weren't tempted to shop. And, you know, I think we have lost something, which is why in the book I'm, I'm appealing to people, whatever their religion, to try to put some Sabbath back into their lives, even if they uh, just, you know, not just, but go, go to a house of worship, or if you don't do that, have a, have a family meal that day, which everybody's around the table, and hopefully you're talking about something other than uh, what might be called Marish cut. Uh, nonsense. Um, or what away your cell phone and black requires the thing. It's interesting, you know, one of the things I think actually thinking about this angle in the book made me kind of realize and consider for the first time. One of the things that I think is most jarring to contemporary Jews about the way the Torah talks about Shabbat is that it is a death penalty offense punished by stoning. Uh, this is very jarring to people. How can that be? Right? Other things, murder and even certain uh, kind of adulterous and, uh, and sexual offenses, people can kind of understand as being violent crimes in a certain kind of way with a victim that maybe warrants some kind of response. But Shabbat observance, and why would that have the death penalty? And in thinking about this, and thinking back on your <coughs> case and the question of the blue dog, it kind of to me, that's only to view it from the perspective of the individual and the religious transgression that they committed. But if you think about it as a kind of harsh <coughs> response to hey, we're trying to create a certain kind of society here, and you just messed it up for everybody else. Right. That doesn't mean we're any more comfortable with execution in a contemporary context, but it puts it in a completely different, uh, in a completely different setting, which is to say, I mean, Shabbat has a lot riding on it, right? There's this, there's this personal aspect, and there's this aspect of not being made mad and enslaved by all our devices, but there's also this kind of social utopian vision of, if I prevent people from going to these places of work and employ, etc., maybe I will create a gap that can be fulfilled uh, in, you know, in some other way. Yeah, I agree. And so in the book, I briefly just you know, call for a volunteeristic response to this. So I, I give a shout out to some businesses that close on Sundays because their uh, owners are religious. You know, a couple of big national chains, Chick-fil-A, which you don't see too much here. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know that one, of course. I know you're all dying to go out and buy a Chick fil A <laughs> Sunday, but no. Uh, and uh, uh, Hobby Lobby is another one. And of course, in New York, there are some pretty big businesses that close on Saturday because they're owned by Sabbath observant uh, Jews. I, you know, I just, somebody sent me an article in traveling the last two weeks that Roger Cohn wrote from Germany about Volkswagen. It's just started a program in its German. Plants, and it just started with a top level of, of people who, who the company uh, provides with blackberries, and they um, they've restricted they, they from a set, from their central station. They, I gather, if I got this right, they they block the blackberries after a certain hour of every day. So when the people go home, the company has decided interestingly and counterintuitively that it's in Volkswagen's interest to have these people 
I don't know what, going to a movie, reading, spending time with their family, rather than buzzing away on a blackberry. Either that or they found that at night they were, you know, wasting time on a blackberry. <laughs> 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 things unrelated to books. <laughs> Great. I want to get to a couple of the questions that have uh, come in here. We can't get to them all, and I thank you for submitting. And I see, actually, even in the time since they came in, some of them have already been somewhat addressed. Uh, but one coming from a college student who is uh, here uh, learning with us this week. Uh, as an observant college student beginning the career search, I have many peers who have chosen to remove their kipot for job interviews. What would you tell them? Yeah, now, i tell them to be better than I am. <laughs> In other words, I'll tell you this story. Once I was going to a meeting, I happened to be walking with Harry Reid, now the majority leader. He wasn't the majority leader there. We're friends. And he said to me, you know, Joe, I've been meeting, he's Mormon. He said to me, I've been meaning to ask you something. I know you're Orthodox. Why don't you wear a skull cap? Uh, so I said, you know, that's a really guilt-inducing question. <laughs> 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 this is something that runs through the one thing. But uh, I said, because in my generation, growing up as I did in Stanford, Connecticut, um, where there was, you know, I never experienced anti-Semitism as a kid. We were a minority. But also, I, I, I didn't just I feel like I, I'd be comfortable wearing a kippah. And as uh, uh, Ethan, uh, Ethan and uh, Becca's uh, younger sister, Hani, who's gone somewhat to the right of the family, will say to Hadass and me, when she's angry at us about some religious, she'll say the ultimate concluding argument is, you two are classic 50s Orthodox Jews. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, you know, you were, uh, you're not really, you, were, you really weren't serious. So, uh, it wasn't in my orbit, but I'd say now on Capitol Hill, that there are a lot of people wearing kippo. No, no a member of, of the House or Senate, but it, I don't think it's a problem anymore. And so I'd say, if you otherwise would wear a kippo, then wear it. And I'll bet you it's not going to affect uh, whether you're hired or not. Let me just follow on this. Another question that came in. Uh, how would you advise a young government aide to observe Shabbat? We work for non-Sabbath observers, who hold staff meetings on Shabbat for their senior staff. Should we turn down these jobs or promotions? Should we go to these meetings? I'm not asking you to give them sock, but in terms of your assessment of, you know, the, the culture and what it is, and I think maybe to, maybe to sharpen, I think what, maybe to play devil's advocate, I can imagine someone saying, well, you're the senator. So first of all, you can say what the meeting is or isn't going to be, and someone will probably drive you into the Capitol uh, if you need to make that decision, and it won't be directly on you. What about someone who maybe hopes to be a senator someday, but as they're working their way up whatever hierarchy, seem to find themselves in situations that are less in their control? What kind of advice on a, on a career level in terms of religious integrity would you give? Well, I mean, the, this this case, I know that there are a lot of people who have gone before you who have worked this out. And now, I suppose if you're really concerned about it, you should tell your employer um, what the what personal rules you go by. But here's where my experience in the general society, in which I found non-Jews respect the observance um, of, re of a religious practice, but generally speaking, your, your employer will accommodate you. But what I'm trying to say is I know of uh, a lot of Sabbath observant employees of the federal government and employees of Congress whose employers know that they won't come to meetings on uh, Shabbat. And uh, hopefully, as I always say to my constituents, uh, I, I promise you I'll work harder on the other six days. <laughs> uh, and uh, they usually do. Right. I'm going to another a little bit difficult question that's been that's been of interest to me in thinking about this. Um, and it's a question really of what Shabbat has to say to the general society and how much the Jewish Shabbat actually translates. Um, a lot of the audience for this book, as you alluded to, is not just the Jewish community, but the religiously and spiritually inclined <coughs> Gentile population in America. Uh, and in the course of making the case for the Sabbath to this group, you say some interesting things. Just one quote here. This book is for both Jews and non-Jews, whatever their personal religious observances may be, because the fourth commandment and its gift of Sabbath rest were given to all, pe to all people. As soon as I read this line, 
I started saying, right? All the lines from the Dominic on Shabbat morning that essentially say, this was not given to the nations of the world, this was not given to the uncircumcised, this is the sign, Beni Uven Bene Israel, between God and the Jewish people, a distinctive relationship. And even you know, these striking statements that go beyond this, where you have you know, one famous uh, rabbinic statement uh, played out in Dvarim Rabbi that's most uh, developed, that a Gentile who observes the Shabbat is liable to the death count. And just to give you this kind of midrashic take, I think it's such an amazing uh, text, the text asks, why would you say that? The text is almost surprised at itself. And it says, imagine a case where a, a man and a woman of high rank are sitting discussing some intimate uh, issue, and someone comes and sticks their head in and says, I have an opinion about this. What would happen to them? They'd be executed on the spot. <laughs> so too, God said to B'nai Israel, Oti b'ni u'b'neichem, this is our kind of private communion, and now someone else is going to come in and observe our Sabbath? It's breaking up the intimate space between God and us. So I wonder if you have thoughts on this sort of tension, and I'll phrase it in this way, not so much on, on Dvarim Rabbah, but on the, on the broader question of, I do think there's, there's some interesting tension here between, on the one hand, there clearly being this universalist thrust, um, the, the vision of a society that doesn't have slaves, um, that lies at the heart of this, that clearly has some broader play than just the people of Israel. And yet, on the other hand, there being something very parochial um, in a positive way about Shabbat. Have you experienced that kind of split, the aspects of Shabbat that feel very universalist, as opposed to some aspects that feel actually like they're deeply, covenantally Jewish, maybe even almost exclusively so? Yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, great observations. Uh, obviously, in the long history of the Jewish people, there have been a lot of voices, including among those who write uh, to be low. Uh, it seems to me that there is a real tension is the right word, but there's a there's a duality to uh, our sense of ourselves as Jews coming out of uh, Tanakh, and it is this combination that we were chosen. Um, of course, we uh, accepted that, that being chosen, but we were chosen. Uh, for the purpose of uh, accepting the Torah and the commandments and living by them, but then also that, that we're supposed to be a light unto the nations. I mean, and and uh, just a lot of narrative through the uh, Torah, Torah and Tanakh, this is, the standard is held up that we, are, that, that we do well as Jews when we behave in a way that brings credit uh, that, that creates an example, if you will, and that brings credit to us as well as to uh, Hashem. So I don't know that I can resolve this. Uh, obviously, um, well, to me, anyway, obviously, the, the Sabbath that, that Christians and Muslims, as the two other great monotheistic faiths, as we say, observe, uh, does take its uh, origin from, from the Fourth Commandment, from uh, the Jewish observance of the Sabbath, and um, there is a kind of, not only theological power to it, but there is a, it seems to me, a kind of human naturalness to it, which we've uh, gotten away from. So, it's probably as good as I can do. Okay. Yeah, no, it's a, I, I throw it out as much for, for yeah. us all to think about that. I think it's an interesting uh, duality in our own observance. And I, and I will say that, just quickly, to go back to the questions you raised before, that I'm, I, I, I'm writing in the book, I invite the reader to come with us and me and our family through a typical Sabbath. And we, we do the book uh, in order. It starts with Arab Shabbat and goes through Havdalah and people going, and going back to work. Um, so part of it is to explain what observant Jews do on Sabbath, but part of it clearly is to encourage people, whether they're Jewish or not, and whether they're observant Jews or not, to try to accept some of the gift of Sabbath for us. And here, I'm, I'm obviously not a rabbi, I'm an observant Jew, but I am also a senator, and I'm trying to make a, a point about the, the larger value, as, as your, your comments and questions illuminated, 
earlier of, of how, how much I think our, our, so many individuals and our society as a whole needs to take some rest. Uh, we have time for just about two, two final questions. One I want to cull from a couple that came in and then one final one of my own. Um, one thread that emerged here from a number of questions was uh, engaging, which you do in the book briefly, the struggle not to observe Shabbat, the temptation not to observe Shabbat. Um, you've come to a kind of uh, stasis where you have a basic method of navigating it. Um, and kind of interested in hearing uh, about earlier points where that might not have been so self-evident. It might have felt like it was you know, tempting not to observe Shabbat. You write in the book having an earlier point in life of that not being a given part of your practice. Um, and to sort of reflect on what ultimately was able to bring you to a stable and committed place that you're in now, both in terms of what it was from your upbringing that shored yeah. you up in that way, and also in terms of any specific Shabbat experiences that were just so uplifting and magnetic that they yeah. brought you forward. So I was raised in a Sabbath observant family, and as I say in the book, I understand that part of the appeal of the Sabbath to me is, uh, is not a, uh, theological or spiritual. I associate it with something as non-spiritual but important as the good smells in the home when I came home on Friday and my grandmother and mother had been cooking. And I still get into that. Um, the, uh, the, the fact that it was a family time, you know, uh, very, uh, was very important. Um, I can't say that I always experienced that with nonetheless as a gift. I mean, there were certain times in my childhood when my uh, friends were going off to, you know, sports events or movies or other things on Shabbat where uh, I wish I could have gone, but that just wasn't accepted by my parents and I didn't go. Then when I went to college, I stopped observing Shabbat. <coughs> well, freshman year, probably the first week I was there. Uh, and as I said, look back at it, I, I suppose I, I must have been rebelling against, you know, I was free now, I was out. Now, go to figure out why I continue to put on Tefillin and try to observe Kashri. Um, the part of it was that I was a, a bit, I, I was fearful I was not going to be, I, I was fearful I was actually going to be kicked out of Yale, and I wouldn't be able to make it. I didn't realize until at the end of my freshman year, or actually later, that you really have to work to be kicked out of these places. <laughs> Once you get in, and you know, really getting back grades was not enough. It was something truly offensive. Um, so I, I went through college and law school that way, and then um, uh, after I got married and, and uh, first child was coming along, it coincided with the death of my grandmother. My grandmother was a very important person in my life. My mother's mother, she lived with us, we lived with her at the beginning. And um, you know, she was really in many ways a benign, warm, wise person. She was kind of a symbol to me of religiosity, but also when she died, I realized in a, in a way that was not very profound at all, really, but it was profound to me, that she was my link to Jewish history. She was from the old country. And now um, I had a choice to make, you know. Was I going to um, sort of fill the gap in the chain of Jewish history, uh, uh, or was I not? Uh, uh, and um, the very next Shabbat, I had lived for a year and a half, almost, right across the street from an Orthodox synagogue I had never been into. <laughs> and I just decided that first Shabbat I wanted to go in uh, for the reasons I've described. And then I little by little it came back to full observance uh, in the next year or two. Uh, and then once I was on that path, I, I was on the Dara. I was on the Dara. And, uh, so I know, and then I really, as time went on, and, I, and counterintuitively, as I became more busy, I became more de devoted to, and in some sense dependent on Shabbat. Um, as I say in the book, and I think you just alluded to this, um, nonetheless, I don't know as much as I've gained, I feel, from my own observance of Shabbat, that I would do it as well as I, I tried to without halakha. I mean, honestly, I don't know. I, 
whether I would stop everything at sundown on Friday night if it was not associated with a, a tradition, a halachic tradition, even a sort of sense of accountability to a higher authority, whatever example. Uh, I just don't know whether I could. So in, in an odd way, and this is a, a tension or another duality throughout Jewish history, uh, it, it is the law and in some sense restrictions that ultimately seem to provide for freedom. Uh, and the best example of it is, of course, borrowing from uh, what my rabbis have taught me over the years, that, that the exodus from Egypt, the, the, this, the redemption of the Jewish people, was only the beginning, really. It was, it was for a purpose. The purpose was the law that would, would that was given at Sinai, because otherwise we just have freedom and no standards, and uh, ultimately probably that, that would lead to the, the uh, abuse and, and uh, limitation, corruption. I want to close with a final question uh, based on a word and concept that I know is deeply affecting for you, and that is destiny, mm -hmm. which you write, around, you write about in the book. And uh, wondering if you can do two things in this. One, at the risk of given our political setting here of uh, starting our own individual private stoning. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, an interesting intersection between Rob Soloveitchik and Sarah Palin as mediated by you, uh, which I think will nonetheless be an interesting story uh, that plays into destiny. But by way of inviting you to give us a kind of parting word of what you know, at, at this point in your career and looking back and looking at the present moment and looking forward, what is the destiny of the American Jewish community? By which I don't mean how many people will be here of what stripe by what year, um, but what is its destiny in the way in which you use that word? What is our contribution supposed to be? And if you could say, particularly to the you know many uh, younger folks who will be here learning this week and beyond, uh, we've already kind of displayed a real passion for saying, yeah, I, I'm in, count me in for this story. Um, here's what our job is and our task lying in. Well, only because I love you, Robin, Tom, if I told you the story. <laughs> so during the 2008 campaign, my walk on the wild side uh, with my friend John McCain, they asked me to come up to um, Philadelphia one day in the fall because uh, Governor Palin was um, practicing for her debate with uh, now Vice President Biden. And um, I had met her uh, once before, and I uh, uh, didn't know her very well. Actually, I think I'd been at one campaign event with her before that time. Anyway, they were going through a class. And the reason they asked me is that I had been, uh, obviously, I'd run for Vice President, and also because I, I focused on national security, homeland security. She hadn't had much experience in that. Anyway, long story short, I think they liked that. They like that. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, she was off that day. And it was really, it was, she just seemed almost in the days. I didn't know whether she was tired from the campaign or something was happening. So the campaign managers, the two managers were there, they took a break. This is really a moment. And uh, we all go out in the hallway, and they're in a panic because they think, oh my God, this is going to be an awful situation. They, they thought, and they later actually did this, they, they took her out to uh, McCain's uh, ranch in her home in Arizona and flew her family and baby. She hadn't seen the baby for a while. But it, uh, so we're out in the hall, and they're, they're kind of anxious about what to do. Steve Schmidt, who was one of the campaign managers, not Jewish, he turns to me and he says, you know, you got something in common with her that none of us have. What? <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're both religious. This was, you got to know Schmidt. He's a sort of big guy with his hair uh, cut off. So he says, uh, you know, he says, why don't you go in there and, I don't know, pray with her or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to pray with her. I went in and she was alone with a woman from Alaska who had been her chief of staff. So I, I said, how are you, how you doing? And she said, you know, I'm just off today. I don't know what, um, I, I, I'm tired and blah, blah, blah. So I, I knew from something I'd read about her that she loved the Book of Esther. So I first talked to her about that. And you know how 
Esther's moment of doubt, and she summoned it because she didn't do it, somebody else would, blah, blah, blah. And oh, they said, that was great, that was so helpful. And I said, you know, forgive me, if you got a minute more, and I said, you know, I've been reading this book by a great rabbi named Salvation, and it's, he talks about the difference between the covenant of uh, fate, which is the covenant that God established at, with Abraham, and the covenant of destiny, which God established with Moses uh, at Mount Sinai, and destiny is the law and the attempt to sort of realize the principles of the law, and, and really it's up to us what we make of ourselves. That's our that's, that's pursuing that uh, destiny, and she, she, she thought that was, she was very interested in that. And thank you very much. It made it feel good. So anyway, um, after I, that story was in the book. Game Change, that was the name of the book, right, about the 2008 campaign. And um, Robertson Lichtenstein, Licht, Licht, Lichtenstein, right there, yeah. who's the daughter of Rav Soloveitchik, sent uh, Rabbi Menachem Kanak, who's a friend of mine, a copy of the pages from the book. And she wrote, would my father ever have believed it? <laughs> <laughs> the lonely hockey mom of faith. <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't know what more I can say about that. Look, uh, it's a, destiny is one of my favorite words because it, it calls on us. I mean, I do really believe that the Jewish people have a destiny. I mean, I think God made some big promises uh, to the Jewish people that we would be an eternal people, that not that life would be easy, and of course it hasn't. Um, but that uh, we would return to the state of Israel, of course, that the whole mission was to try to live by the law uh, and to uh, do tikkun uh, olam, as I say in the book, but we forget, at least in the, in the later version of it, it's tikkun olam b'machus shaddai. In other words, to perfect the world under the sovereignty of the Almighty, which to me always means that the values that we take from our belief in creation, everybody is a Mr. God, everybody has to have equal opportunity, uh, values that are carried out here in Makam and Dara and all. Uh, that, that's the, the special uh, Jewish mission. And that, that the other promises that we've been given about our destiny are sort of wrapped up in our ability to, to live by the law. And um, so I think, you know, that over Jewish history, over American history, Jews have contributed greatly. Uh, to this country in so many different ways. Uh, it has, I'd say to the, the college students who are here, um, you, we, but are members of truly blessed generations of Jews. Because we, for two main reasons. Uh, one is that we live in America, which has given Jews and everybody else, most everybody else, if you happen to be black, a good part of our history happened to be a woman, not so much, but eventually, uh, given us more opportunity, more freedom, um, uh, more respect than anywhere else in, the, in our history, except for Israel, when, during the good times. Uh, and of course, we're alive uh, at the time when the state has been recreated. So um, I think our destiny is to, to, we should go forward with confidence that the promises that have were made have been kept, and yet the journey is never ending until we achieve ultimate redemption. Uh, and this is where we come back to the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is, you know, a taste of of, um, of uh, eternal life, of the next world, of the messianic time, um, uh, toward which um, we are all uh, aspiring, uh, and that we continue to have that faith that we will get there step by step. Uh, and each time we try to take those steps, I think we we do our part to improve not only our own lives and the lives of people closest to us, but the life of, of this country. And so I think the Jewish destiny is uh, integral to the destiny of America. America is a country in, in our, a lot of our documents that um, also loves the word destiny. I'll just say a final word to bring it home in an ecumenical way. There's a, uh, a man named Michael Novak, who's a Catholic social commentator, some might call him a philosopher, a theologian, but he wrote a really 
a fascinating book called On Wings of On Wings of Eagles or On the Wings of Eagles, but it's about the founding values of this country, and he says that uh, too often uh, the the credit is given exclusively to the philosophers of in, of the Enlightenment for motivating the founding generation of Christians who created America and the Constitution Declaration of Independence. He said they deserve credit, but um, the other major source, the other wing of the American eagle is what he calls the Hebrew Bible. And you know, he makes a fascinating, I think, compelling case, although I probably wasn't too demanding a judge, uh, listen to the case he made, that that is true through our history. But here's the point I want to uh, end with, which is he says that one of the great contributions of the Hebrew Bible uh, to um, the human understanding of, of what our, our lives are about and history is about is that contrary to early, other earlier civilizations that had a circular view of history, that the, the Jewish, the Hebrew Bible view of history is linear. It's, it's going somewhere, uh, either literally or metaphorically to the Holy Land, or etc. And he said that vision is very much, that value, <coughs> that sense of destiny and, and linear challenge to constantly improve, to get better, to, in a sense, to realize the values in the Constitution, in our law and practice, just as we are challenged as Jews to realize the values of the Torah in Halakha and in our, in our lives. So, um, I think we have a special mission as Jews and an opportunity to bring our sense of destiny uh, to, to the American vision of destiny and, and benefit both in the process. So I want to thank you for being so open and sharing so much this evening and uh, thank you to everyone here for coming. Uh, we can't promise sitting United States Senators every week here at Mahon Adar, uh, but we do promise that this is how we talk about Torah. Uh, in a deep way, in a way that engages with the world, and in a way that both challenges and uplifts us. I really invite you all, if this is your first time ever here, uh, to come back, visit us both online, but also here in person. Uh, this week is a banner week with all kinds of wonderful lectures uh, going on in the, in the evenings. Uh, and just in general, to think of this as a Makom Torah, a place of learning uh, that you can be a part of and that you can support in all kinds of different ways. Uh, Senator Lieberman will be here for a few minutes uh, to sign just a limited number of copies for those who have bought the book uh, or who will buy the book uh, to, uh, to sign uh, copies. Uh, we invite, I know I'll see about 40 of you tomorrow morning for Shafrit at 7.30, uh, but many of you who are perhaps not yet planning to come should also think of coming. Uh, and uh, we'll be here every week, this every morning this week uh, at 7.30 a.m. Uh, for Shafri to which you are all invited. Thank you very much.